Coming up on DTNS, Gogoro's battery swapping scooters expand to India, Europe's aiming to regulate AI, and how VR can make you healthier. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, April 21st, 2021. 21, 21, 21. In Los Angeles, I'm John Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In SLC, I'm Scott Johnson. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. Uh, we were just talking about uh, spinoffs of spinoffs on TV shows and old board games like Operation. If you want that wider conversation, become a member and get good day internet at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Instagram will roll out a new abusive message filter for message requests and direct messages with a common list of abusive words, phrases, and emoji compiled by anti-bullying organizations. The company will also introduce a feature to proactively block new accounts created by people that a user has already blocked, rolling out over the next several weeks in the UK, France, Germany, Ireland, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Microsoft Outlook now includes an optional setting that lets individuals and companies automatically start or end all meetings early to give time between back-to-back -back meetings. Why did it take this long? Microsoft said it had added the setting based on its own research on digital overload impacting employees. Amazon added Amazon One Palm readers at a Seattle Whole Foods market with plans to expand the tech to seven other Whole Foods stores in the area over the coming months. These readers were previously only available at Amazon Go stores, letting you link your palm to a card for payment and then use your palm scan at checkout. Celebrite is a company that helps governments and police agencies crack into encrypted devices, particularly mobile phones. Signal developer Moxie Marlinspike has posted about some vulnerabilities in Celebrite software Wednesday that would allow the execution of malicious code on a Windows device and modify Celebrite device reports, both future and past. Marlon Spike said that they will responsibly disclose those specific vulnerabilities to Celebrite if it does the same for the vulnerabilities it uses to conduct its operations. Seems fair. Cerebra Systems unveiled the Wafer Scale Engine 2 processor, which includes 2.6 trillion transistors and 850,000 AI optimized cores in an 8 inch by 8 inch square wafer, more than double the cores of its CS1 processor that debuted back in 2019. The new chip will ship in Q3 of this year and is optimized for supercomputing AI applications. All right, let's talk a little more about these AI regulations. Uh, earliest days of this. This is like talking about GDPR in 2016. Uh, the European Commission proposed a bill Wednesday to develop comprehensive regulation of artificial intelligence. The draft would have to go through several rounds of revisions by the European Council and European Parliament before it reaches its final stage. But here's what's in the initial proposal. Most uses of AI would not be regulated. Uh, we're, we're usually seeing these stories reversed, but I think it's good to start with that. So your video games, your spam filters, you know, all that stuff, that's not going to be regulated. Some AI uses would be lightly regulated. So deep fakes, customer service chatbots, those would just need to disclose that an algorithm is being used. Hey, the, we used a deep fake algorithm on this. Or, you know, you're talking to a bot, it's not a real person. But some uses would be heavily restricted or even banned entirely. And that's where the majority of the debate is going to occur, particularly around what are now some vague terms. High risk is one of those terms. Examples of high risk include software used for critical infrastructure, algorithms used by police to predict crime, remote biometric systems, particularly facial recognition. Facial recognition would only be allowed for specific cases, like finding an abducted child, stopping an imminent terrorist threat, locating a suspect of a particular crime, uh, anything from fraud to murder. And outright bans are proposed for uses like a social credit system, something they're using in China, subliminal techniques, or taking advantage of someone's disability to distort their behavior in a way that causes harm. High-risk uses that aren't banned would need to show human oversight in design and use and meet some, at this point, still vague quality requirements on training data. Uh, there is a, a template for this. Financial organizations already work with regulators to show how financial algorithms work. This is a result of regulations put in after the financial crisis. So that sort of provides a template for how you could have regulators examine how AI works. Whatever form the bill takes, the intention would be to regulate AI used within the EU 
as well as any AI used outside the EU that impacts an EU citizen. So you're at the earliest stage of this, uh, Scott, Sarah, if if you were to say like, here's one thing I want to make sure goes into this proposal, what, what, what do you think you'd put in there? Oh man, I've been thinking about this a lot since we, uh, or since I saw it in the lineup and my first, my brain always goes first to gaming because that's just where my head's at. And thankfully it sounds like they're not counting that. There are huge jumps in AI technology that happen in the gaming space. And some of that makes it way its way out of there and into other industries and other parts of everyday life. And um, one would wonder if if that keeps happening. Like, let's just say AI behaviors in VR, which we've talked about on the show before. If that stuff, suddenly we go, oh, there's a real world application for this. I assume all of that stuff has to go through review, even though they're not sure yet if it still counts as lightly or more regulated than it than it already is like to me there's the devil's in the details on stuff like this and so my my brain always thinks well sure you can say ai in a halo game's fine today but tomorrow if we find out a way to make it work in real life are we gonna have to have that discussion again um i don't know it's a, right it's a not, really... not in not in halo but in an actual like mech suit that has been invented something like that yeah and, or or yeah. just you know a, an application we can't even think of that's usually what ends up happening is we don't even know but how these, how, you know, ideas come, uh, iterations and ideas come from other stuff. Something sparks a new idea. And then we're like, oh, what if we use this in this or whatever? And companies like Microsoft and bigger companies like that could actually find applications outside of uh, the origin of the technology. So I don't know that it's it, to me that there's there's uh, there's bumps in this road, but I couldn't actually point to any of them because I actually think they've thought really well about this so far. Like it seems mm -hmm. like they've C categorize things in the proper place, but I think there's a lot of unknown. Yeah, I think as far as just the the bill that's being proposed and how it's been broken down to most things not regulated, some light regulation, and then once you get into law enforcement and you know trying to you know we get you start talking about terrorism or abducted children, that's where it gets a little bit tricky. And I think the idea that the AI used not only within the EU, but anywhere in the world that it would impact an EU citizen is the whole world, right? And so then you start getting into, well, there are some local laws that that don't allow law enforcement to use a certain kind of facial recognition at all, but it, but that's not a blanket rule, uh, you know, across even a nation anywhere, right? So you, you start to, it starts to get a little bit messy as to who is being affected and where are they at any given time? And going back to the law enforcement thing, if you are looking for, you know, <laughs> child gets kidnapped, yes, we all want to do everything that we can to to make sure that the child is found as safely and as quickly as possible, right? But is that going to uncover something else in the in the process of trying to find that child? And what do we do with that kind of information? Because we have the technology uh, to to sometimes get information that wasn't really supposed to be gathered at the time, but maybe should be acted upon. A lot of gray areas. Uh, I, I think, yeah, the devil is going to be in the details and how you define, like, what is a use of facial recognition? I mean, there, we all can can conceive of the the ones we're okay with, and we can all conceive of the ones we're not. Uh, it's the it's the ones that are on the line between those where where this is all going to be battled and and a good template for figuring out like well when they say if it impacts an EU citizen doesn't that mean anything in the world uh, a, a good way of looking at that is GDPR right now and and which companies have to deal with GDPR and which companies said you know what we're just not going to operate in the European Union anymore uh, if we have to do that which there were a few this all comes on the heels of a US FTC blog post Monday detailing actions it will take against companies that misuse AI. The Post said, quote, the FTC Act prohibits unfair or deceptive practices that would include the sale or use of, for example, racially biased algorithms. Later in the Post stating, whether caused by a biased algorithm or by human misconduct of the more prosaic variety, the FTC takes allegations of credit discrimination very seriously. So a call that uh, they are going to be paying attention to how algorithms are deployed uh, in enforcing the law on the side of the U.S. FTC. All right, let's shift to uh, Netflix. They just had an earnings report. How are they doing, Scott? They sure did. They reported subscribers rose from 204 million last quarter to 208 million. Now, unsurprisingly, that's much lower growth than last year in the first part of the pandemic uh, related lockdowns and so on. They had that huge growth then. It's also less growth than Netflix had predicted for itself. Netflix attributed the slowdown to a lighter content slate, is their quote. 
uh, in the first half of this year as a result of production shutdowns in 2020. We're starting to see those delays now. Netflix did not identify the increased competition of more streaming services like HBO Max, Peacock, and others as a factor. You have to imagine they probably were, at least some level. Netflix says a second strong half with the return of The Witcher and movies starring The Rock and Leonardo DiCaprio, not necessarily together, will accelerate growth. Although put them together and then you got real growth, man. Anyway, meanwhile, Netflix predicts it will add 1 million subscribers next quarter. Yeah. Now, so we're gonna have another slow quarter from Netflix. Uh, I, I think they're right. I, I think, you know, not having a, I think this is another way of Netflix nicely saying we didn't have a big hit. Bridgerton was, was our only big hit. Uh, and, and it didn't carry us, uh, in this last quarter. I, I think that's, that's fair. And they haven't been producing as much, but I always thought Netflix was better positioned for the pandemic because they were producing so much content. And they even said last year, like, Hey, our production isn't going to be suffering as much. So they're changing their tune a little. I think a lot of this has to do with competition. Yeah. They have a deeper well, but they also, uh, you know, that's one of the things their competition actually came to the table with fresh, which was. Hey, we're HBO, we're doing Max, and we got all the HBO content, all the Warner Brothers content, and a whole bunch of stuff you forgot we owned, and here it is, and we have it on day one, whereas Netflix has had to pull in third parties through contracts, and it would come and it would go, and then slowly build up their own stuff. So I think they're in a great position, and everything's going well, but I think there's a lot of strength in these competition or these competitors than I expected. Mm -hmm. Like, that stuff really yeah, I mean. Up. Netflix is, you know, it's it's the classic, it's going to be the classic example of a company who saw explosive growth in 2020 because everyone's at home, you know, let's sign up for Netflix and start watching some movies and some shows. Let's start at the <laughs> season one, episode one of Friends. It'll take us a few months kind of thing. But, but, but yeah, we have a lot more competition now. And I think that Netflix was going to have their market share eroded. And last year is just kind of a weird year and it's it's has spilled over into 2021 as well but uh this probably has more to do with the fact that netflix is not the only game in town and and less to do with um its growth just slowing because everybody in the world has netflix because there's still a long way to go you know, when we were preparing for this week in science crossover uh, over the weekend, somebody asked us about why aren't they do battery swaps? And I responded like they do. And one of the things I pointed out was Gogoro. And we've got some news about Gogoro today. In fact, we do. If you are not familiar with Gogoro, scooters that are powered by Gogoro's swappable rechargeable batteries now make up about 25% of the vehicle sales market in Taiwan. 25%. Wednesday, Gogoro announced that it will partner with Hero Motor Corp to build a battery swapping network in India. Hero will also launch electric two-wheelers under its brand using Gogoro's technology. Hero will also start in India before expanding into some of its 40 other markets. So India... Pretty big market, big motorbike place. Gogoro launched its first smart scooter back in 2015 and has since reached partnerships with Yamaha, PGO, and A Motor. It's also expanded outside Taiwan in small ways, like a delivery fleet that's working in South Korea and small efforts in Europe and even in the US. But Taiwan has been its booming success with more than 375,000 riders and 2,000 battery swap charging stations executing 265,000 swaps per day. Wow. Gogoro's app monitors battery conditions and manages charging so well that it says it's not needed to retire one battery from its system in six years. Yeah, we've been following Gogoro since 2015 here on Daily Tech News Show, and I, I felt like they are undercovered uh, as, as a technology innovator. One of the reasons is that they have only been operating at scale in Taiwan uh, for the last several years. So moving into India, having a big partner like Hero, which is a big company there, uh, is, is a great test of whether this can work outside of Taiwan. It's a smashing success in Taiwan, and it'll be interesting to see if they can replicate that in a much larger country. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, we love patrons that stick with us. That's why we're happy to offer Patreon loyalty rewards. You can get a unique sticker, mug, T-shirt, or hoodie every three months, as long as you stay a patron at a certain level. In fact, uh, someone on Twitter was pointing out that the hoodies that you get are so comfortable at that level that their daughter stole them. So it's a good thing <laughs> they're going to stick around as a patron and get another one. Uh, each of the items has unique art from Len Peralta featuring the DTNS seven year anniversary logo, as well as depictions of myself, Sarah and Roger get the details at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's get into the New York time publish, uh, publishing a story pretty interesting today, Wednesday about how virtual reality is helping the physical and the uh, occupational therapy sector of medicine. Not the first time the show's talked about 
BR helping in those areas, but this is some good growth. The MYT interviewed Michael Hendrick, who permanently lost use of the lower half of his body in a motorcycle accident and has been using VR in his ongoing recovery with good results. Dr. Brennan M. Spiegel, a professor of medicine and public health and director of health services research at the Cedars-Sinai Medical Center in L.A., tells the Times that VR helps patients who are trying to train themselves and stay motivated away from a PT center. Can't be there all the time. And that VR nudges the human brain in ways that other audiovisual media cannot. Boston-based XR Health is one of the companies focused on VR for physical and occupational therapy at home. It's uh, covered by some insurance companies as well in Massachusetts and nationally by Medicare. Uh, or people can pay $179 uh, monthly for the headset and two physical occup occupational uh, therapy appointments monthly. Uh, it's not that bad, not too bad. Um, an analyst of 27 studies conducted by Matt C. Howard, an assistant professor of marketing and quantitative uh, methods at the University of South Alabama, found that VR therapy is, in general, more effective than traditional programs. And this doesn't even crack open the the, the case for uh, mental health and therapies that are being uh, sort of done with VR right now in that space. So really cool stuff happening with VR in the medical area. Yeah, we, we've talked about pain management and uh, post-traumatic stress uh, as, as examples of that. Uh, but this, this new physical therapy uh, approach is very interesting because, for one thing, it, it allows you to get instant feedback. Uh, if, if any of you have done physical therapy, which I have, uh, you know that it's really hard to remember exactly what you're supposed to be doing when that physical therapist is no longer there. Like, am I, am I holding my back right? Am I doing it right? Like we, we would take videos of myself doing it on my phone so I could look at it and kind of compare, but VR can provide you that kind of instant feedback of like, no, you're not, uh, move your arm, stretch your arm. Oh yeah, no, now you got it. Now you got it. Now you're doing it. Uh, and one of the other effects that needs to be studied more to see how big it is, but there's lots of anecdotal evidence that people will do things they don't think they can do in VR because they really want to pop that balloon, right? Or they, they, they really want to get that next score in the game. And that can advance therapy faster than if you're just in a, you know, a, an empty room with mirrors and a, a bunch of plastic balls. Yeah, I, I, I know that uh, for some folks, uh, going and getting an appointment that wasn't life-threatening was really hard at times over the last year. Um, I mean, myself included, I didn't have to go to physical therapy, but there's like, you know, optometry appointments where they're like, yeah, we're in a pandemic. Unless your eye fell out, you're not coming, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> so I think there are a lot of, you know, there's there's a lot of just... Uh, issues with with getting in-person appointments, especially when the physical therapy is pretty dramatic and it's something that you really can't do by yourself. You know, you do need a medical professional to be helping you, making sure you're doing things right, um, making notes of your progress or, or what isn't working, all of that stuff. And to be able to have that that much more of, of, you know, options and flexibility in the comfort of wherever you may be. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm all for this. I mean, I, I talk about VR as a great fitness tool all the time. Really, you know, I, I find it extremely motivating and fun. And that's yeah, just because, I mean, we, we, sh we should all be exercising, you know, heart rate's good, but it's not something that I have to do or else, you know, my arm will not work anymore. It's something that I just really enjoy. But to be able to couple that with actually really needing to do things precisely and and the repetition to be just so and be able to send data back to your doctor is is such a such a step forward. Yeah, I agree. As a as a total side personal note, my sister uh, is a professional therapist and not always the first on tech. Like she's not always up on the latest tech advancements, even in her field. But she is over the moon with progress made specifically with VR and emotional and cognitive therapies. And we'll go on for days if you let her uh, about the stuff that they're seeing there. So one can only imagine we're just now cracking into this egg and this is just going to get more interesting as time goes on. Yeah, we're booking your sister on a Wednesday. That's got to happen. <laughs> I, can, I can see it happening. Uh, speaking of uh, the stress of health, uh, Fitbit will bring its stress management and stress score tools to devices that it already was selling that have a heart rate monitor, including the Versa 2 and 3, Inspire 2, and the Charge 4. That's right, bringing a feature to an old device. Hey, nice job, Fitbit. Uh, the Fitbit Sense launched with the stress score alongside an electrodermal activity, or EDA sensor, that tracks electrical changes on your skin 
that may indicate a stress response. See, you'd think uh, Fitbit might want to force you to go buy that new device to get a stress score because it's the only one that has the EDA sensor, right? That's a compelling reason. But apparently, you can calculate the stress score without the EDA sensor. For the older Fitbit devices, the feature looks at heart rate, variability, sleep data, and exertion levels to generate that score. Everybody gets to see the score, and if you subscribe to Fitbit Premium, you see details on what contributed to it. Now, everybody always wants to know, is this actually medically effective or is it just a fun, you know, data-driven game that I would like to play? Well, Fitbit points to a study published in the journal Clinical Psychology Review that found that something called MBI, uh, Mindfulness-Based Interventions, from online where you get nudged to like pay attention to yourself like the fitbit stress score have potential to contribute to improving mental health outcomes particularly stress they, they still need more work to be done but the early indications are yeah this this does have a positive effect oh man i'm so excited about this i i rock my versa too uh all the time uh, i wear it to sleep a sleep data is one of my favorite things to look at in the morning you know if i got a crappy night's sleep and i see all the times that i woke up at night it doesn't really help me figure out why i did that but including a stress score into this especially with yeah how much did i exercise how tired was i did i have some sort of a weird stress by spike midday and can I make some sort of a correlation as to, you know, what was going on at that point? You know, any information, especially information that, um, that, uh, you know, studies are, are backing up like, yeah, this is information that it's not going to make stress go away in your life. You're going to have to do that on your own. Right. But, but to at least give you a little bit more of a tool to figure out what might be triggering you. Yeah. I, I, uh, I have a charge for, and, I think it's awesome that that thing is going to get support for this. Um, and it's got stuff to back it up. Like you hear there are apps all the time. You spend any time on Instagram, you get advertised to 50 times a day for some kind of, you know, perfect stress management tool. And it's usually just an app that tells you to breathe or whatever. And that's fine. And I don't want to besmirch them all. There's some in there that are probably okay. I just like the idea of some actual science some peer reviewed content that makes its way into a program like this. Um, that to me just gives it more authenticity and I'm more willing to give it a, uh, give it a shot. And, you know, Lord knows I could use better sleep. So I'm going to give this a shot see how it goes. Yeah, me too. I, I subscribe to Fitbit premium. So uh, it'll be interesting to see, you know, if you get a stress score, it's like your stress score is 89 B plus. You kind of go, okay, <laughs> I guess I'm doing great. <laughs> Right. But to have a little bit more information that's broken down about what's actually going on and, you know, get, getting a little bit more charts and graphs uh, might be helpful. Fitbit Premium, I believe I pay seventy nine dollars a year. So it's not cheap, um, but it it does make these sorts of tools a little bit more robust. Just don't get stressed out about your stress score. No. Yeah. Or it'll no. show up in the detailed report. Yeah. yeah. For some yeah. of us, a C plus worked just fine in high school. It worked just that's fine right. here. <laughs> Just relax. That's the takeaway. Just relax. <laughs> <laughs> You're so emotional. Okay. <laughs> Bandai announced the Tamagotchi Pix. This is a new version of its pet rating game that has a built-in camera. The device is shaped like a hatching Tamagotchi egg. The broken shell part of the top is also the shutter button. Then you put your Tamagotchi pet in the photo with you. Yeah, so wherever you might be, it maybe is sort of a bragging right, like, look at where I got my Tamagotchi pet to go with me. Pictures are stored locally. The Pix doesn't have Wi-Fi, but you can share pictures using QR codes. There are also some new game features, like having an effect on your pet's future employment prospects based on things like how you decorate their room. It's Tamagotchi stuff. You're either into it or you're not. Tamagotchis also get new activities like painting and cooking, ordering food for delivery, you know, just like us. Pre-sale of Tamagotchi Picks starts today for $60. Yeah. Uh, first of all, many of you are like, wait, Tamagotchi still exists? Like, yeah, they, they've been, you know, iterating on the idea uh, ever since the 90s, uh, still putting out new stuff. This is the latest one. Uh, they want you to call this AR. They want you to compare it to Pokemon Go. It's not. It's merely sticking the Tamagotchi in the photo with you. There, there's not much augmented reality about it, but it's, I don't know, it's cute. It's a cute idea, right? Sure. I mean, I don't know how many of you, I know, you know, it never really went away. Tamagotchi was a thing. I don't know. What was I, a teenager, I guess, when that first thing came out? And it never has really left. It's been around in some form or another. But there's something about raising a virtual thing and 
not, not having too many consequences if it dies, just kind of, you know, feed it fake food and, and fake pet <laughs> it and then hope it grows into something cool. And now that we live in a time of cameras and AR and, you know, this sort of stuff, it makes perfect sense. It's also cheaper and more accessible than it's ever been. So maybe this is the big new hot rise again from the ashes Tamagotchi moment, the way that Pokemon Go turned Pokemon into a more, I don't know, every day, every house kind of thing. And uh, it'll be huge, but yeah. I'm not buying one. <laughs> For the price of a brand new Apple TV remote, you can get yeah. a Tamagotchi pick. <laughs> just, just two dollars more, or and one, it'll work I guess. just as well as the current remote, Tom. Did you know that your Tamagotchi is just <laughs> as likely to work with your Apple TV as your all current right, remote? All right, stop baiting me. <laughs> yeah, this is not something that I will be purchasing either. But this is also, I'm well aware that there are a bunch of people out there. They're like, it's only sixty dollars. This is going to be so awesome, and there's going to be a whole TikTok genre about it. I can see it now. So if you enjoy your Tamagotchi picks after playing around with it for some time, do let us know and send us an email, feedback at dailytechnewshow.com. Speaking of, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. So Scott, not Scott Johnson, a different Scott, wrote in and said, uh, we were talking about the Apple's uh, spring, spring loaded. loaded spring loaded event yesterday on yesterday's show. Scott says it would be just like Apple to update iMacs and iPad Pros with the M1 chip, and then later this fall update the MacBook Pro with the M2 or M110 or M1X or whatever the next chip is that doubles the GPU, etc. Right. That's what I'm hoping for. Scott says I feel like everyone is all a tither about this announcement, and I'm yawning. I mean, I'm not getting a new Apple TV 4K for the remote or the newer CPU. I suppose the iPad Pro is the biggest thing if you're someone that uses an iPad Pro. My plain Jane iPad works well for me. Yeah, no, this, is a, this is a good reminder that just because Apple announces a thing doesn't mean you have to get it or that, <laughs> that it somehow has to be the thing you can't resist getting. Like, it would be just like Apple to release a new iPhone every year. Uh, or, you know, refresh <laughs> iPad Pros in, in the spring and, and other iPads in the fall, because that's what they do. They're always releasing new products. So I, I think this is a good reminder of like, hey, you know what? If you're like, man, I don't know if I'm impressed, then don't buy anything. You wait, wait for the next product round. Maybe, maybe you don't need one. And yeah, you don't need to get the new Apple TV 4K if you've got a perfectly good Apple TV 4K that you're into, or you don't need 4K. Uh, it's it's all yeah. all relative. Yeah, and you all, you said something earlier too that I, I'm a big believer in more than ever, and that is use get what you need in the moment that you need it. Meaning, don't always be thinking about well, I'll wait for the next one because there will always be a next one, and just, whether it's Apple or Samsung or anybody else, it's always going to be a new one next year. So if you keep playing that game, you'll never get anything, or you'll always, you know, kind of psych yourself out and end up with a with a device that's 10 years old and then mad at yourself because you're not taking advantage of new stuff or whatever. Just get what you need for what you need. Like, I'm going to get that new iPad Pro, not the two terabyte, whole other story. Um, but the reason I'm doing it is it's time for an upgrade, and I make a huge part of my living with that device as my primary art tool. It makes sense for me, time to do it. I'm not going to get one of those awesome-looking uh, iMacs. They look amazing. But I just got an M1 Mini that I is kind of doing everything I need it to do and then some. Like, it's really outperforming what my expectations were. So I'm not that guy either. And do I know there'll be something with a 2 on it and then a 3 and then a 4 and maybe these Xs in between? Absolutely there will be. But welcome to, like, the last 50 years of computer, you know, changes. That's just the way it is. So I, I feel what he's saying. I just think it's important, like you say, Tom, once in a while, is just remember we don't have to do anything. Yeah. It's on Apple I'm, to give us reasons or Samsung or Google or whoever. If they're going to give us a good enough reason, then we'll think about it. And yeah, uh, update your products as often as you want uh, when you when you think you got something worth worth changing because that that makes them better. So by the time I need to buy something, there's lots of cool new stuff in it. But that doesn't mean I have to get the new thing every time it's announced. Uh, the, o the only thing I would say to people in general is if we're close to an Apple announcement or we're close to a historic Apple announcement, Maybe wait a couple of weeks to find out what they announce. Yep. Agreed. Oh, also, the I know people bring it up all the time, but I'll just say it again. Apple Rumors has that amazing, um, they keep it up all the time, that amazing chart. And it's basically every product Apple has, when it was last released, what was the latest refresh, and then a kind of a general recommendation of whether you should be looking to buy now or hold off because there's a new event in a month where they may announce a new one or whatever. And they give you kind of a range of, Maybe you're okay, or definitely buy because it's brand new, or don't get it because we think there's new pros coming out this fall or whatever. It's really helpful if you're somebody out there going, 
I don't have to pull the trigger today, but I might soon. I need more information, and that that tool's awesome. It's really good. Well, thanks for the email, Scott. Thanks to everybody who emails us. And also, big shout out to patrons at our master and our grandmaster level. Today, they include High Tech Oki, Tim Ashman, and Brandon Brooks. By the way, even more special thanks, the specialist of thanks to Mike McLaughlin, who today is in the top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Well, he is every day, but today we are celebrating you, Mike. Thanks for all the years of support. Also, thanks to Scott Johnson. Scott Johnson, how the heck have you been since last week? Oh, I've been pretty good. Uh, we are now at the halfway point of the Kickstarter I mentioned last week. Huge thanks to any DTNS folks that helped uh, reach out and, and support that thing. Um, as a result, things have gone a little nuts, and we broke through our eighth stretch goal already. And Stretch Goal 9 is just there looming, looking at us. We're only a couple hundred bucks away. So if you want to play a really fun, casual card game with your friends, family, or whoever in a very competitive way and have lots of cool, fun sci-fi surrounding it, buy gum you're going to like, Rock Runners Incorporated. Go, so, uh, go check it out. It's Rock Runners on Kickstarter, and we'll be there for another 13 days or so. And again, giant thanks to everybody who helped out with that so far. We are live on this here show, Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Our own Tom Merritt is out tomorrow, but we have Rich Straffolino filling in. Plus, we'll have Justin Robert Young and Dan Compost joining us. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>